are currently just under one and a half billion motor vehicles on the road globally. In the most populous countries of the world, such as the US and China, electric vehicle usage struggles to reach 5% of all vehicles on the road. And that's not going to change all that quickly. You see, in order to transition everyone into having electric vehicles, we would need to produce 1.5 billion electric vehicles to cover the needs of people who are replacing their 1.5 billion motor vehicles. That's going to take a long, long time and a lot of resources. Not to mention what happens to the 1.5 billion motor vehicles once we don't need them anymore. Do they just go to scrap? Will we actually bother to recycle them? Who knows? But if it's the case that we are going to replace 1.5 billion motor vehicles with 1.5 billion electric vehicles, we need a way to deal with the old ones. Another point, about 88% of all energy globally still comes from non-renewable sources, such as oil, coal, and natural gas. While many Western countries are taking strides in developing renewable technology, many countries around the world are still reliant on hydrocarbon-based power. Not to mention that not all countries can afford the transition into green technology. On the other hand, we have less than 10 years to turn ourselves around when it comes to sustainability. We need fast, effective change, and we can't afford to teeter around the edges of the issue. So then, what's the solution? And what is my first major research project for Adenia? Allow me to explain. Biofuels are not a new technology. In fact, they're pretty ancient, because technically the first biofuel was discovered thousands and thousands of years ago by primitive humans. That's it, wood. Wood is made up of long fibers of cellulose held together with a substance called lignin, and when dried, it makes an excellent burning fuel, and for thousands of years has been used to do things like cook food and heat people's homes. When wood is heated in the absence of oxygen, it forms charcoal, which is actually not too dissimilar to the coal that we get out of the ground. That is because coal is, in effect, very, very old wood, because coal is actually the fossils of ancient forest that over time have sunk into the ground. The type of biofuel we can refer to wood as is biomass. This is a type of biofuel that is a raw material that can be burned or turned into other stuff. So what other types of biofuels are there? In the 7th century, writings by Jabir Ibn Hayyan describe the flammable vapours of wine. In the 8th century, another Persian writer, Al-Kindi, went on to describe the distillation of wine, and this was the start of the discovery of the alcohol known as ethanol, the same alcohol that we've been drinking for thousands of years. However, it took until the late 17th century for a chemist known as Johann Tobias Lowitz to distill ethanol to purity. He created something known as absolute ethanol, which is ethanol without any impurities including water, and he did this by distilling ethanol until it was azeotropic with water at about 96%, and then by filtering it through charcoal, he removed the water and was left with almost pure ethanol. Filtering through charcoal removed the water because charcoal is actually a mild desiccant, a substance that can absorb water from a mixture. This happened many centuries after the alchemist Razis first discovered substances such as alcohols and sulfuric acid. Fast forward to today, and actually a lot of the petrols that we use in our cars are actually blended with ethanol to a varying degree. Most places top out at about 80% ethanol to petrol, but some countries such as Brazil have vehicles that can run on 100% ethanol. Biomasses such as wood and alcohols such as ethanol are what's known as first generation biofuels, and they both have their own respective issues. Wood, while being very renewable, is also very polluting when burnt, and when done on a large scale, this can not only impact the environment, but can also impact air quality, which can cause various respiratory health issues. Ethanol, 
while being way better than digging the ground for oil or fracking for natural gas, it doesn't come without its own share of issues. The primary feedstock for the world's ethanol production is either sugarcane or more commonly corn, and this takes up a lot of land that could otherwise be used for food production, not to mention the soil depleting effects that monoculture has. Ethanol also packs less energy density than conventional fuels such as petrol or diesel, and so we need more of it to keep vehicles running. Also, some older cars tend to not work so well with ethanol, as their engines simply aren't designed for it. However, newer vehicles typically compensate for this through the use of software. While ethanol may not be the best biofuel out there, it can be used in the biofuel industry for various things, which I'll touch on later. I should probably mention the main environmental benefit of biofuels themselves, which is that they create a sort of artificial carbon cycle where fuels are burned, whether by vehicles or power stations or what have you, and they release their emissions into the atmosphere, which are then reabsorbed by growing more feedstock plants. And it's a similar story with, in my opinion, a slightly better biofuel, which is biodiesel. In 1890, Rudolf Diesel himself created biodiesel as a drop-in replacement due to the diesel shortage at the time. Instead of burning an alcohol, with biodiesel, you're combusting a non-polar substance known as a fatty acid ester. And these fatty acid esters are derived from vegetable oils. Now it's actually possible to run vehicles and lots of other stuff on just vegetable oil alone. However, vegetable oil has the downsides of being too viscous for some engines and has a much higher ignition temperature. While ethanol production requires feedstocks that have a dense source of carbohydrates in them, a dense source of sugars that can be broken down and fermented into alcohol, biodiesel can use a greater variety of feedstocks that each provide a different vegetable oil. This can be rapeseed oil, sunflower oil, uh, olive oil, soybean oil, and various others. And each of these oils has a different composition. Vegetable oils are made up of what's known as triglycerides, a glycerol molecule attached to three fatty acid tails. If you add a basic substance to this, a substance which has a high pH, that substance will break apart the bonds between the glycerol and the fatty acids and will actually bond to the fatty acids to form soap. However, when we introduce an alcohol into the mix, such as methanol or ethanol, under dry enough conditions, a reaction known as transesterification occurs. And basically, this is where the base catalyst, such as potassium hydroxide, takes a hydrogen away from the alcohol and creates an ion. And this ion can go and break the bond between the fatty acid and the glycerol molecule, and can actually react with the fatty acid to form the fatty acid ester, ergo biodiesel. Now biodiesel, along with ethanol, is actually quite a versatile fuel. However, the one key difference between biodiesel and ethanol, sans them being uh, two different molecules and all that, is that with ethanol, the production input energy compared to the output energy is a positive 25%. And that is actually quite poor relative to biodiesel, because biodiesel can actually yield around 90% more energy than is put in to produce it, not to mention it has a much higher energy density. Brilliant, right? Well, about half of the cars on the road are petrol, and biodiesel can't be used in a petrol car, not that I'm aware of. Not to mention that a feedstock is still needed, and in the case of a first generation biofuel, this comes from crop feedstocks such as seeds and grains. Now, apart from something I will introduce a little later, biofuels themselves don't actually typically change from generation to generation. When we say things like first generation and second generation biofuel, as I will talk about in a second, we're typically talking about the feedstocks they come from. First generation biofuels have the inherent problem of vast land and water use required for their production. However, second generation biofuels attempt to solve this issue by instead of using fresh feedstocks, 
instead using waste products from various industries to create fuels. The downsides of this is that those feedstocks aren't necessarily of good quality, nor is the supply of them consistent. For example, waste cooking oil is often used as a feedstock for biodiesel. It often comes from various different sources with different qualities that vastly affect the production process and the results vary quite a lot. Yet it is a bit more sustainable than using fresh feedstocks. But what an even better alternative? Well, I bring you the topic of my current research project, third generation biofuels derived from algae. But why algae? Well, when you think about a normal plant, like a tree or even a flower, in order to grow, it needs to work against the forces of gravity. And in order to do that, it needs to build up structural support, usually in the form of cellulose and hemicellulose, and a lot of the time lignin. This means that the plant spends less time building fats and proteins, which thus limits its energy density. Because algae mainly grows in water, and because of buoyancy, algae spends less time building structural support for itself, and more time building other things like lipids and proteins, and some carbohydrates. Different species of algae have different distributions in terms of their nutritional profile. For example, the algae I'm growing Spirulina plantesis is quite proteinaceous, it has a lot of protein, but it has a relatively low lipid content, whereas a species such as chlorella has a higher lipid content but less protein. And in terms of biofuels, these types of algae are suited to different applications, which I will talk about in a second. Most species of algae have a decent amount of carbohydrates in them, and if these could be separated from the rest of the biomass, it could serve as a sustainable feedstock for ethanol production. Now I mentioned just a second ago that different species of algae have different nutritional profiles. Something like chlorella, for example, being high in lipid content, could serve as an ideal feedstock for biodiesel production. The oil could be dry pressed from the biomass, with the rest of the biomass being used for other things, such as being turned into a compost for crops as a nutritional supplement, or could serve many other applications. Since spirulina has a relatively low lipid content, its usefulness in biodiesel production is much less than that of chlorella. However, it still has some lipids, some carbohydrates, and a lot of protein. And in terms of algal biofuels, there is actually a new area of research emerging. Algae derived crude oil. And this actually makes a lot of sense, because the oil that's dug out of the ground and out of the oceans is actually very, very ancient algae that's been buried under the ground for millions of years. And when it was actually alive, a lot of it was phytoplankton, which obviously live in the sea, which is why a lot of the oil that's found is in bodies of water. So how do we take a million year process of algae breaking down into crude oil and speed this up a little bit, just a tad, so that we can effectively make our own crude oil? Well, researchers have been using a process known as pyrolysis, which is essentially baking something at high temperature in the absence of oxygen. A relatively simple way to do pyrolysis is through hydrothermal synthesis, whereby reactants are heated in the presence of water to hundreds of degrees, and this creates a lot of steam. And the steam builds up pressure, and this effectively acts as a catalyst for the pyrolysis. The resulting crude oil, known as pyrolysis oil, can then be separated into its different components, mainly via distillation. This affords a variety of products. One of these products is a mixture that's quite similar to petrol that gets put in cars and is mainly composed of aromatic hydrocarbons, much like petrol is. According to a few research papers, however, a downside of spirulina pyrolysis oil is that it contains a lot of nitrogenated compounds, compounds containing nitrogen, and this is an undesirable impurity. And there is a lot of bleeding edge research going on to figure out how to remove nitrogen from these compounds. Some other challenges to be overcome when it comes to pyrolysis oil is the energy cost and how to control pollution. Producers of algal crude oil will need to figure out how to make the production process more circular in order to minimize the release of waste into the environment. They will also need to figure out how to make the process more cost effective and sustainable by reducing energy costs. Thankfully, solar provides a lot of solutions to this. 
One of the things we can do is use solar furnaces to pyrolyze the biomass into oil. Another thing we could do is use fiber optics instead of artificial lighting to help grow the algae itself. But these solutions will need to be investigated further. A hidden advantage of algal biofuels in general though, is that growing them can be very vertically scalable. With the right amount of investment, one could, for example, convert a five-story building into an algal growing facility consisting of large indoor ponds using either artificial light or redirected sunlight. This means that growing algae as a biofuel feedstock is nowhere near as land intensive as its alternatives. And this adds to its sustainability. Not to mention that algae is also a powerful carbon sink that can absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere very quickly. And if done on a large scale, this could actually have a tangible impact on greenhouse gas emissions. Just a quick note, something I didn't mention when talking about biodiesel is the recent advent of something called hydro-treated vegetable oil, which is basically vegetable oil that's been hydrothermally treated, basically pressure cooked, into a more usable fuel. All in all, biofuel research is still alive and well, and there's lots of stuff going on behind the scenes. And I'm definitely looking forward to researching third generation biofuels as the first major Adenia project. I hope you've enjoyed this video, or at least found it informative. And I hope you've learned something about biofuels. If you like what you see, and you want to see more content from me, then why not join the channel by subscribing? Sharing this video and others on social media helps the channel gain exposure and also allows others to gain awareness and knowledge of science, technology, and sustainability. Thank you very much for watching, and I will catch you all next time. Take care. Bye for now.